So today in this short webinar, I'm going to discuss with you the research and application of blood flow restriction within elite sports. Um, my name is Dr. Stephen Patterson, and if you've got any queries or any questions about this presentation, um, you can contact me on social media or you can get me by email on the screen in front. So what is blood flow restriction? Well, I like to split into three different applications. The first application is that of resistance exercise with blood flow restriction. And this involves partial restriction of blood flow to the working muscles with the prevention of that blood returning back to the heart. And the pressures that are typically used are between 40 to 80% of an individual's limb occlusion pressure, with 100% being the minimum pressure that fully occludes all blood flow. So by working between 40 and 80%, we're guaranteeing that some blood flow is going to the muscle. The loads that are used are generally low, approximately 20 to 30% of your one repetition max, with no real added benefit of using higher loads. Secondly, we can perform different forms of endurance exercise, again with partial blood flow restriction. The pressures used, again, are between 40 to 80% of limb occlusive pressure, with some movement towards the lower end of that scale due to the longer duration of effort. So for example, we've seen some work in the lab where individuals aren't able to maintain pressures of 70 to 80% limb occlusive pressure for a longer period of time, and we have to reduce those down to the 40 to 60% range. The intensity is often used, again, is low. So for example, during walking, cycling, rowing, but the intensities are below 50% of an individual's VO2 max. And we use that for either intervals or continuous efforts. And this produces similar adaptations as higher intensity exercise and leads to import, um, improvements within, for example, performance of time trials, VO2 max, um, and vascular adaptations. Finally, we can also use blood flow restriction passively. This involves no exercise, but the pressures used are higher and equate to about 100% of your limb occlusive pressure. Typically, this involves short two to five minute periods of full restriction, followed by similar reperfusion periods. This method has been used again to increase acute exercise performance and help recovery following strenuous exercise. So how can we apply blood flow restriction to elite sport? Well, to date, there's very little research specifically in elite populations. Research that has been done has shown that blood flow restriction adaptations are similar to that of untrained or recreational athletes. So for example, we see increased strength, increased muscle mass, improved sprint performance, etc. But despite the limited research in the area, we do know that it is regularly applied in elite sports settings. Um, with very good adaptations and responses. So for the, for the rest of this presentation, I'm gonna sort of cover a range of different applications of blood flow restriction and ways I think it can, and know it is currently being used within elite sports settings. The sort of main area where it is used and it's being used well is around the idea of injury and rehabilitation. I'm not going to cover that in today's presentation, but that is being covered in another presentation for this series. Other potential options are around the idea of managing training load and stress, allowing us to manage pain, allowing us to acutely enhance performance, and finally, allowing us to improve recovery following strenuous exercise. Let's first of all think about this idea of managing training stress and load. Blood flow restriction is most commonly used for rehab when higher loads are not tolerated. However, there is potential to use this mode of exercise to manage total training load and stress imposed following intense training periods. For example, implementing blood flow restriction during appropriate stages of a periodized training plan may help counter the potential negative effects of high overall training loads. And these are normally brought about by you know, increased gym-based work, multiple fixtures in a week, so fixture congestion, pitch-based um, conditioning, etc. Now, the ability to improve, 
to improve strength and muscle mass with minimal mechanical stress and muscle damage may therefore be useful, for example, during extensive travel or tournaments when equipment may also be limited. Indeed, in a recent study out of Denmark, it has demonstrated how alternating periods of blood flow restriction training with heavy load training leads to similar improvements in strength. And in this case, um, maximal voluntary contractions um, in comparison to heavy loads only for six weeks. So in this case, what we're seeing here is an improvement in MVIC of between 12 and 7% for the, for the blood flow restriction and heavy load combined group, as well as the heavy load group respectively. They also demonstrated that they were able to increase the cross-section area of type 2 fibers in both groups also. So demonstrating that even though the load reduced, um, on alternating weeks of resistance exercise, the adaptations were exactly the same. So we can be confident that we can reduce training load and stress by reducing that mechanical load by um, alternating between blood flow restriction and heavy load training whenever you feel there is a need to deload, the, deload that athlete. Other opportunities include the ability to perform periods of microdosing, for example, increasing the frequency of training for a short period of time. Due to the low load nature of blood flow restriction and low mechanical stress, it can be applied once or twice per day for a short period to induce rapid gains. Now, the following study from Nielsen demonstrated that large changes in muscle mass following 23 sessions in just 19 days. Here they demonstrated an increase in muscle fiber cross-sectional area of up to 38% in as little as eight days, which was maintained until the end of the study and up to 10 days post-training. This was supplemented with a 10% increase in strength also. And this work demonstrates that despite training lasting approximately three weeks, adaptations occurred after one week. So we know that we can apply this for a very short period of time to induce adaptations. Now, Thomas Bjornsson um, out of Norway took this premise and introduced two one-week blocks of microdosing of blood flow restriction training for a group of national level powerlifters. And interestingly, they find that this led to an increase in isometric strength in the blood flow restriction group. However, front squat one repetition max was better in the conventional strength training group despite trends for improvements with blood flow restriction. The blood flow restriction group did, however, increase the cross-sectional area of the vas lateralis, but this was mainly attributed to an increase in type 1 fibre cross-sectional area. Now, for elite athletes concerned with impairing power and speed, this may not be advantageous, but it is likely due to the large muscle mass and strength of this well-trained population before the study began. So we have a a series of studies there which demonstrate that we can, we can microdose, we can increase frequency for short periods of time and induce adaptations within strength and muscle mass. So from an athletic perspective, we can think about um, certain periods of the season, in season, pre-season, where we can actually do short periods of microdosing of potentially blood flow restriction, which will allow us to um, get those adaptations that we desire. Another potential application is to reduce either pre or post training pain. So what we do know is that numerous athletes train and compete with pain and niggles. And therefore managing training load and exacerbation of pain is a complex issue. One way we can do this and currently being employed in elite sports settings is using blood flow restriction before or after practice and games. So there are a number of studies which have shown that blood flow restriction can decrease knee pain acutely and chronically compared to normal heavy loads. And more recently, our group have tried to explain the reasons why. Now the following figures basically show pressure pain threshold before five minutes post and 24 hours after either low load exercise, 
blood flow restriction at both 40 and 80% of the limb occlusive pressure and heavy load training. And they do this for the exercise leg in the top left, the non-exercise leg in the bottom left, and then the biceps in the top right and the trapezius in the bottom right. And briefly, what we demonstrated was all exercise acutely improves pain sensitivity in the exercise muscle, as well as remotely in the opposing limb and the upper body. However, this improvement in pain sensitivity was only in those um, for the first five minutes post-exercise. However, blood flow restriction significantly improved pain sensitivity for up to 24 hours with both 40 and 80% um, limb occlusive pressure, but the 80% limb occlusive pressure group had the greatest impact. So we know that we can actually get a, a reduction in pain um, for at least 24 hours if we use um, blood flow restriction at 80% limb occlusive pressure. And the final method I will discuss with you today is that of passive blood flow restriction. Now the schematic here on the screen shows three different ways that it can be useful. The first is muscle atrophy, which I'm not going to cover, but um, the second two are to enhance acute performance and also then for recovery. Now, one thing to make note of is it's important to apply pressure when using a device that can measure limb occlusive pressure. As seen in this figure and the, the pictures on your right hand side, the body position of the individual changes limb occlusive pressure. Thus, this measurement should be used and not arbitrary pressures because a lot of the passive blood flow restriction work and the work of ischemic preconditioning, as it's also known, uses arbitrary pressures rather than um, based off limb occlusive pressure. In the next two slides, I'm going to focus mainly on this performance and recovery aspect of training. So passive blood flow restriction is also known as ischemic preconditioning, or IPC, and it's applied before or after exercise. So in this case here, you can see that the red blocks represent five minute periods of full occlusion or 100% limb occlusive pressure, with five minutes of reperfusion applied in between. And this is all done before exercise performance. Now there is a multitude of research in blood flow restriction or passive blood flow restriction and ischemic preconditioning research, which has shown it's a potential benefit of this mode for improving acute exercise performance with the main improvements coming via endurance or aerobic based exercise. However, future research needs to standardize pressures via limb occlusive pressure. As I mentioned, they normally tend to use arbitrary pressures or 220 millimeters of mercury. And why that's a problem when we come to working with athletes is that we know that they tend to have much larger um, muscle mass. Therefore, 220 um, millimeters of mercury, which is standardly used, would not be enough pressure to fully occlude every single one of those individuals. And that probably explains the the discrepancy that we see within the research with, with regards to passive blood flow restriction and IPC performance research. The final mode of application is to enhance recovery following strenuous exercise. And the evidence points towards application after exercise in a similar fashion to IPC, works so for example, periods of ischemia and reperfusion. So Bev and Natal in the top um, figure there, they were the first to demonstrate this following strenuous exercise, which consisted of strength training um, and sprint training, which was, and was basically a typical training session for athletes. More recently, our group has looked at this and mainly following muscle damage. And in this case, we, prevent, we performed 100 drop jumps um, and then applied the passive um, blood flow restriction to see if it could enhance recovery. And essentially what we find was there was an improvement or a faster recovery of force production, in this case um, by approximately 24 hours um, following passive blood flow restriction as evidenced here by the black squares. This also resulted in um, much 
lower um, increases in creatine kinase levels. And um, again, which started 24 hours and was actually never really increased in comparison to the control group. And also um, reduced pain over the time period as well as measured by a visual analog scale. So we were able to demonstrate that um, whenever we use this, um, this mode of exercise following um, exercise, we can actually help reduce um, pain, damage, and improve recovery overall following um, the exercise itself. So in summary, we can use blood flow restriction to manage training load and stress, potentially um, serving benefits during deload periods, um, during long distance travel when equipment access is minimal, and during periods of things like fixture congestion. It can also be used for short periods of high frequency training or microdosing to improve specific um, required um, qualities. One thing to remember is that blood flow restriction is whenever used and um, applied, we can do this relatively quickly. So you know, one exercise lasts between sort of five and 10 minutes and it's normally enough um, to give enough of an adaptation um, depending on the exercise that's chosen. So there is obviously some potential here of using it frequently and quickly. We can also use it to reduce pain for niggles and um, to get players through training and games. Um, and again, something just to consider is that we potentially suggest that we use higher pressure, so 80% limb occlusive pressure, and this can normally last for up to 24 hours. Um, there's also some evidence that we can enhance acute performance with passive blood flow restriction and ischemic preconditioning. Um, and finally, we also know that this can possibly help with recovery following strenuous exercise. So for example, we may potentially be able to use it um, immediately after training or even letting the athletes take the, the cuffs home with them or if we're in hotel rooms or whatever, it allows us to apply um, this recovery modality while people are just sitting at rest. Finally, for further guidance on how we can apply blood flow restriction and its safety, um, we've put together the following article, which is a, um, a series of experts all over the world to come together with some consensus of how we can apply BFR um, and some of the, the sort of programming guidelines with regards to different, the different modalities that I've discussed today. Thank you.